We've talked about functions before, and in this lesson we need to talk about composition and inverses of functions. We're addressing state standard number 24, where students need to solve problems that have functional concepts such as composition and inverse function and performing arithmetic, arithmetic operations on functions. Sorry, can't read. Our objectives today are to find the composite of two given functions and then find the inverse of a function. So let's talk about the definitions. If f and g are any two functions such that the range of g is in the domain of f, then the composition of f and g is denoted by this notation. And we read this from outside in and we say that this find the f of g of x. So let's do this by numerical example. If f of x equals x squared and g of x is x plus 2, find f of g of 3. And if you recall, we likened this idea to an assembly line, so to speak. And we said you're going to take 3, the number on the inside, and we're going to work our way out. So 3 is going to go into machine or function g first. And a reminder, g says to replace x with whatever number is coming in, add 2 to it. And that the composition of functions is like more than one machine on an assembly line. Once we've taken 3, substituted into function g, that end result goes out into function f, which says whatever number comes in, take that number and square it. So let's go through the process. If we substitute in 3 for x, 3 plus 2 is 5. We're going to take that 5 and now put it into the function f, and what comes out of that is 25. So we can say that f of g of 3 is 25. Let's look at another numerical example. If f of x is x plus 4 over 2, and g of x is 2x minus 4, for example, 2a, find f of g of 2. That's our first goal here. So what we need to do is we need to take 2, substitute that into function g. The end result that comes out of that, substitute that into function f. So we're going to take 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 4, which gives us 0. That 0 then, the end result, the range of g of x, is going to become the domain of f of x. Replace x with 0. 0 plus 4 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So we can say that f of g of 2 is 2. Now for example, 2b, we're going to go non-numeric, and we're going to find f of g of x. So in other words, everywhere we see an x in the first function, we're going to replace it with x. So we'll replace this x with x, and that's going to give me 2x minus 4. However, in the second function of my composition of functions, wherever I see x, I'm going to replace it with 2x minus 4. So 2x minus 4 substitute that and add 4 to it. That's going to give me the 2x minus 4 plus the 4 divided by 2. And when we simplify that, 4 minus 4 drops out to 0. 2x divided by 2 is just x. Curious thing about this one is we substituted x went into the composition of functions and I got the exact same answer out. Now we could have used a number like 2 or negative 17. We would have got the exact same thing back out again. Now what we want to do is the same situation, the same functions, only instead of f of g of x, we want to reverse the order and do g of f of x, and we are actually going to use x again. Because what we want to show is the phenomena that's going to occur in example 2b and 2c work for any real number x. So in the first function, we're going to replace x with x. What comes out of that is x plus 4 over 2. That goes into the second function, g of x, but we replace x with x plus 4 over 2. So instead of x, we have x plus 4 over 2. The 2's cross reduce, leave me with x plus 4, minus 4 is going to give me x. So in these last two examples, I put in x, I got out x. Then I change the order of my composition of functions. I substitute in x, we got out x. When that happens, 
Those two functions are called inverse functions. The functions f and g are inverse functions if you put a number in, do the composition of functions, so f of g of x, and you get x. And then you change the order, g of f of x, and you get out x. Same thing you put in is the same thing you get out, and if you do that for both orders, and you still get the same number, then they're considered inverse functions of each other. They undo each other, so to speak. Now, we actually have notation, and be careful about this notation, because it looks like the variable f raised to the negative 1 power, and the negative exponent would mean take the reciprocal. But that is not what we mean by this notation. This notation, I did not invent it, but we just have to learn it. This means the inverse of the function f. The inverse of a function f. By the way, remember that a function has an inverse if and only if every horizontal line intersects the graph in at most one point. Remember way back to our first look at functions. If a graph passed the vertical line test, it was a function. If it passed the vertical line test and this horizontal line test, it was a one-to-one -one function. So what we're saying here is that one-to-one -one functions have inverses. And inverse functions are mirror images of each other with respect to the equation y equals x. Think of that equation as the axis of symmetry. So if you have a point AB on one graph, you will have the point BA on the other graph. Whatever point you have, change the order, you will have that point on the graph. So let's consider two interesting graphs because this is the direction we're headed in this chapter. What we have is an exponential function, y equals 10 to the x power. And what we have here is called the logarithmic function. We haven't looked at this yet, but we see the word log. So y equals the log of x, base 10. That's how you read that. Now, when in doubt, chart it out, I always say. So let's try to make a chart of points for y equals 10 to the x power. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose some negative numbers, 0, and some positive numbers for x. If I put in negative 2, I get 1 one hundredth. Put in negative 1, I get 1 tenth. Substitute in 0 for x, I get 1. Substitute 1 for x, we get 10. Substitute 2 for x, we get 100. Now, the interesting thing is that I'm telling you, because we haven't really discovered this yet, that these two functions are inverse functions. And the reminder here is, if they're inverse functions, if we have the point AB on one graph, we have the point BA on the other. Translation, for y equals 10 to the x, we have the point two, negative 2, 1, 100. Since this is the inverse function, we're going to trade places of the x and y numbers, and we're going to have 1, 100, negative 2. Instead of negative 1 and then 1 tenth, we're going to have 1 tenth, negative 1. Instead of 0 for x and 1 for y, we're going to have 1 for x and 0 for y. We're changing the order of those points. Instead of 1 for x, 10 for y, the log function, we're going to have 10 for x, 1 for y. And instead of 2 and then 100, we're going to have 100 and 2. So we don't really know anything about using our calculators. We don't really know anything about logs. But if we tell you that these two are inverse functions, you can graph them. First, by making a chart of points for the function we do know. And then secondly, by reversing the x and y numbers. And here's what the graph looks like. <clears throat> We've seen exponential functions before. So here is my graph of y equals 10 to the x. Somewhere out here at negative 2, I have 1 one hundredth. At negative 1, I have 1 tenth. At 0, I have 1. At 1, we're way up here at 10, which is off my graph. Here's my axis of symmetry, so to speak, if we think, for the inverse functions. And if we were to fold this graph paper on this line, my exponential function and my logarithmic function would match up. So here's the point 1 one hundredth negative 2 on my logarithmic function. Here's the point 1 tenth negative 1. Here's the point 1 0. And eventually out there we'll have the point 10 1. So what we need to know right now is the inverse of an exponential function that has a base of 10. It's called a logarithmic function with a base of 10. 
So as we just stated, these two functions are inverses of each other. We need to know about exponential and logarithmic functions of this chapter.